Hi. Uh, welcome to Berlin, everyone. Um, that, ooh, look, I can hear myself. Uh, everyone that doesn't live here, everyone that does, nice to see you. I know most of you have worked with you all. Um, my name is Ben Green. Um, welcome to the most deliberately low-tech presentation of JSConf. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I work on a, a bunch of web projects, JavaScript-based and, and others. Um, I'm not talking about those. Maybe next year if they go well. Um, I work in uh, Berlin uh, for Nokia on a great big mapping application. Uh, and I'm not going to be talking about that either, if you want to know anything about that. Um, Andrea's talk tomorrow is going to be brilliant. Uh, take your hangovers and enjoy that. Uh, so, I'm Ben Green, but you can call me anything you like. Sideshow Bob is uh, quite a common one. Um, and the title of my talk is uh, How to Be Better. Uh, it's how to be better, how to get better. Um, how to decide how good you want to be. How to argue with JS Lint. Uh, but if anything, it's a celebration of core JavaScript. Um, so, a little bit peculiar coming straight after Sammy's talk uh, about frameworks, um, because this isn't frameworks, it's, it's core JavaScript. Uh, first question then, I suppose, that needs to be answered is, is what does getting better mean? Um, the original rubric for this talk uh, said that it was one mediocre JavaScript developer's tedious and ongoing attempts to become slightly less mediocre. Uh, that's me. The big shots of JavaScript are here. Um, fortunately, no matter how uh, embarrassed and nervous I am, I don't think I can beat Brendan Eich's nervousness and embarrassment this morning when uh, a very nice young lady sang to him. Um, so that's okay, but the big shots of JavaScript are here. I am not a JavaScript demigod. I'm not sitting on a, a cloud saying, hey, I'll give you a hand up, this is how, this is how you get here. Uh, I'm struggling to get there, uh, just exactly the same as everybody else. Um, the second part of it, I suppose, is when did JavaScript get hard? Um, it is hard, there's no doubt about it. There's a lot to learn. Um, when I started on the, the internet, when the distinction between the internet and the World Wide Web was still important and relevant, um, the, the internet at the time was all particle physics and tributes to Jerry Garcia. Uh, if you don't know who Jerry Garcia was, see me after class. Um, yeah. Light bulb jokes and Klingon jokes. Um, this is an unsustainable ecosystem. As soon as the uh, ultimate mashup of the internet happened, which was how many Klingons does it take to change a light bulb, um, that was the end of that. It was doomed and uh, we needed something else. A new thing, of course, came along. Uh, thanks, Tim, was, uh, was the World Wide Web. Uh, and things started to get difficult straight away. Um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the start, it was dead easy. Um, everyone wanted to get their, their documents, their brochures. Uh, they wanted to get them up in, uh, in the electronic space. And this was by no means programming. Uh, there was nothing about this that we would recognize as programming today. Um, but at the time, back then, no one could touch type. Computers were still sufficiently intimidating uh, for, a, for a profession to grow up out of this. Um, then those. Uh, nice folks at, uh, at uh, Microsoft, um, they invented a way where you could change, or rather you had free access to the SRC uh, property of, a, of, a, of an image, for example, and suddenly we could change images. Um, and we called this DHTML. Um, and then the, uh, again, it was Microsoft, uh, again, they invented uh, this thing called Ajax. And the job boards went mental with, we want people who can, who can speak Ajax. So you looked it up on, on the uh, World Wide Web, which we now call the internet by this time, uh, you looked up and you found it was two new things you needed to learn. One new XHR request, ActiveX component thing, um, and uh, on ready state change. You looked at this and said, excellent, I can do Ajax. Um, and at this point, uh, things started to get interesting. And um, we started a game called a mystery, uh, Mastery Buzzword Bingo. Um, DHTML became Ajax. Ajax became object orientation. Object or orientation became behavioral di driven development. Don't know what the next big thing is that we're going to have to do is. BDD is already about six months old, so uh, in internet timetables, uh, certainly a little bit stale. Um, but it's the, uh, it's the paper, scissors, rock, Spock of, of uh, JavaScript mastery. Uh, BDD beats OO, OO beats Ajax, Ajax beats DHTML, DHTML beats no, no, Flash, I suppose. Um, and the, uh, it's about halfway through this list, somewhere between uh, Ajax and object, object orientation, that things got interesting. And when it got interesting, then we could do more with it. And when we started being able to do more with it, um, it attracted a better, a better uh, caliber of developer. And better developers come in. What do they do? They make it more difficult for the rest of us. Um, the more difficult it gets, the better quality developers it attracts, the more the pay goes up. Um, and it keeps getting harder and harder. But the great thing is, all of this stuff was there in, uh, in, the, uh, in the original spec, really. I mean, 
Douglas Crockford invented, uh, invented JSON. But it was already there. It was, it was already part of, of JavaScript. I mean, obviously, Harmony is going to uh, do great things about this, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it all. Uh, it's going to throw away the rule book, and it's, it's going to become some real proper stuff. So the question is, if JavaScript's getting harder, or it's attracting better developers, um, what are you going to do about it? Um, the original rubric I wrote for this talk, uh, the one that, thank you guys, uh, got me the talk in the first place, um, said uh, something along the lines of, you've ri Yeah, I'm missing a slide. Um, there we go. Just keep talking to it, shall I? All okay. right. Uh, I'm missing a slide, actually. It, it looks like that. Um, uh, no, you can't see it. It'd, pro it'd probably turn up somewhere a little bit later on in the, in the show. Uh, this is low-tech, uh, as I said. Um, the original, uh, the original uh, description of this talk said, OK, so you've read the definitive guide. You've flicked through the ECMA standard, and you've joined your local user group. What are you going to do now? How do you take the next step? I spoke to a bunch of friends of mine, JavaScript developers, that I, I love and respect and, and think uh, great things of. It turned out that none of them had read the definitive guide, and very few of them had flicked through to the standard, and uh, none of them had joined local user groups. So I wish this was on the, uh, on the, on the screen, actually, because it's a good one. It's got ticks. Um, this, is, this is what I say is the, the first step. This is, this is not what I want to talk about today. These are the first steps. So go back and, uh, and look at these things. And of course, it doesn't have to be the definitive guide. Um, the guy downstairs talking at the minute is written in one of the very greatest uh, books on JavaScript there is, in my opinion, and I don't know why you're not all down there. He's wonderful. Um, you don't need to read the ECMA standard, of course. You can read Dmitry Shoshnikov's explanation of it, which is just like the ECMA standard, but it's explained and it's got, um, it, it's got good English and much, much far fewer square brackets in it, um, which certainly play with my head. And you don't need to join your JavaScript local user group. Join a user group where you can talk to other developers um, about coding, about writing stuff. Um, the things I want to talk about today, um, uh, sorry, just to go back, um, those three things, they're the start, they're not the path. Uh, the path I want to talk about has, has these three strands on it, uh, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. Uh, the talks, how to get better. Um, clearly, we're at JSConf, we're going to be talking about JavaScript, we're going to be using JavaScript examples, but it's about getting better. This might not be the best talk here, but it's the only one that tells you that it's going to make you happier and healthier and better person. There we go. First off, then, uh, the purpose. What is the purpose of what we're doing? First up in purpose is uh, the product that you're working on. Do you love the product? I'm lucky I'm working for a team um, that really, uh, really gets, me, gets me quite excited. As a nine-year-old kid, the only thing that I thought was really important in the world was maps. Well, sort of maps and computers and that girl who worked down the chip shop, but um, never got anywhere with uh, one out of three of those. Um, so uh, maps and sausage and onion mash, I suppose. Um, none of us are feeding the world or curing it of AIDS, unless any of you are, in which case, come to me, I'll give you a donation afterwards. Good work. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't engage with the products that we're creating. Me, I'm working on maps. Not your maps, as I said, I'm not going to make a big song and dance about it. Um, but the purpose for the product, um, there are more important things in the world than maps, but I really love it. Um, number two in purpose is your users. My personal experience on this one, of course, I've been freelancing for many years now. I'm working sort of full time. Um, but the product that I'm currently working on, it's in beta. We don't have any users. Um, we have beta testers, but you can't trust them because they're all fanboys. Um, which takes us on to the, uh, <laughs> some of them are not very really, uh, really nice about it either, but there we go. Um, which takes us on to the team. Um, the question about the team is uh, possibly the one that's sort of hardest to address. Um, you have to get on with your colleagues, um, clearly. Um, if you don't, then do something about it. Um, if you're a lone JavaScript developer, you're probably not going to get any better. It's going to be really difficult for you. Try and get yourself into a team. Clearly, if you are a lone JavaScript developer, if you're a jobbing freelancer and you're having fun, absolutely fantastic. There are plenty of talks at this conference that will help you with your jobs and your day-to-day -day work. This talk is about how to get better. And it did say at the start, you need to decide how much of it you want to do. The question that's uh, relevant with your team, though, about you getting better, is are you the best JavaScript developer on the team? If the answer is hell no, that's fine. Um, if the answer is absolutely yes, then it probably isn't. The important answer is the one that goes, hmm, yeah, well, you're sort of not quite sure. Um, and if you're in this position, then you're not going to learn as much from your team as someone who's more junior. So you now have to, uh, 
you have to find something else to do. So if you love your product and you love helping your users, but you're sort of maybe top dog in your team, it's about time to start giving something back. You've got to mentor all the juniors. Uh, you've got to teach the world. Um, start a blog. Why not? There are loads of good blogs out there, but there's always room for another one. There's always a new angle. Um, or you can quit. I've done it. I've quit more jobs than, uh, than I've had hot milk. Um, you learn quickly as a freelancer. Jump between jobs, you will learn stuff from people because you will meet an awful lot of people. You'll get exposed to a lot of stuff. It won't all be good. You'll see stuff that you go, oh my god, that's terrible. Shit, I did that last week. And you'll stop doing it. You can learn from negatives as well as positives. Um, but for my money, the best way to learn, once you're getting good, once you're coming somewhere close to mastery, is long-term development on, a full, on multiple life cycles of a product. Let's look at the next one, then. Purpose, autonomy, and mastery. Mastery. This is probably the one that's sort of most interesting. Um, when I spoke to the organizers, they said, I hope you're going to show us lots of tricks and great little things that will make you a better JavaScript developer. And I said, of course I am. Um, there aren't any. It's as simple as that. There's nothing I can say. Do this, and you will be a better JavaScript developer. Understand JavaScript, and you'll be a better JavaScript developer. But there's nothing I can say. There's nothing I can give you to take away that if you start doing, you'll get better. However, we can say some stuff. What's mastery? Uh, there is a definition of mastery in a dictionary. I can't remember which one it was. Uh, the ability or power to use, control, or dispose of something. So we all use JavaScript. This is good. We're all here because we use JavaScript. But do we control it, or does it control us? Control is deliberate and careful construction. Really glad to see Sammy talking about construction. We're constructing stuff. Are we constructing JavaScript, or are we chucking it all together in, uh, in a pile, uh, like a rubbish bin outside a restaurant? Um, are we making it go beyond what, it, what we think it can do, what we think it can naturally, natively do? To dispose, to dispose of something. The meaning of dispose is to throw away is a fairly modern meaning, really. Um, what it generally means, what, it, what it's always used to mean, was to deal with finally and conclusively. So to achieve mastery in something is to use something deliberately and conclusively. Are we using our JavaScript like this? An example, maybe. Is the best JavaScript developers I know write the best unit tests? I mean, we don't need to open a conversation on unit tests. We all write them. We've all got 100% coverage. We all run them before every commit. Of course we do. <laughs> Especially me. <laughs> there are team members of mine here. They're the ones laughing hardest. I, I can feel it. Um, but there we go. The best JavaScript developers I know write the best unit tests. This isn't an accident. It's because they're writing tests, which they're, they're writing code, excuse me, which they control, which they natively understand. There's nothing strange about it. There's a famous golfing quote that's uh, variously attributed to Arnold Palmer and Gary Player, but it was in actual fact neither of these. Um, after shooting an ex extremely long and difficult putt uh, on the 17th green or whatever, um, and sinking it, some, uh, some wise commentator said, you know, Arnold or Gary or whoever it was, you're really lucky. The answer was, I know, it's amazing. And the more I practice, the luckier I get. It's just the same with writing unit tests. If you're in control of your code, your tests will be easier. It's a good, uh, it's a good mark of if you're, if you're winning, if your unit tests are getting easier. Um, deliberate and conclusive means there are no WTFs in JavaScript. Here's my favorite one. Okay, I'm sure you've all seen it. It's, uh, it's not completely unheard of. It's, it's not particularly new. It doesn't matter. It's still my favorite, even though it's old. Uh, we have two expressions. Uh, the first one has an empty array equivalent to false. The second one has not an empty array equivalent to false. Presumably, only one of these expressions can possibly evaluate true. The other one must be false. Question and answers are boring. I'm not going uh, to say hands up or anything. Um, but these what the fucks here um, encapsulate pretty much all JavaScript WTFs, or at least all the easy ones. Falsy values, type coercion, and operator precedence. They're both true. The first one is simply a statement of fact. Um, the falsy values in JavaScript, we don't need to know them, do we? We all know them. The falsy values in JavaScript are right there. If you have an empty array, it equates to false. However, the truthiness of an empty array, you stick a, stick a bang before it, and you're no longer looking at the empty array. You're looking at the truthiness of an empty array. Arrays are objects. Objects are always truthy. Objects aren't in that list, so the truthiness of an empty, object, uh, of an empty array negated, false. Both of those statements are true. Um, when I first started designing this talk, um, I thought about starting with falsy values, and then I thought, no, that's patronizing, and, and, uh, and uh, we're all way beyond that. 
and then a couple of days later, um, and I genuinely do work with some of the best JavaScript developers I've ever met, I found a wrong, falsy value. Someone had got something wrong. So learn the small stuff first. I know you all know this. You all know there are six falsy values, not five and not seven, and you can, uh, you can, uh, you can reel them all off on the top of your head, uh, off the top of your head. But first thing is learn the easy stuff. Second thing is learn the more difficult stuff. Again, this is patronizingly easy. I'm not attempting to, you know, to, to show anyone anything new here. Two ways of making an array. One is using the new word over the array constructor, and the second one is the, the, the literal construction of it. Okay, my suggestion isn't that this is really new and exciting. It's just a nice card to show what I actually want to say, which is there are 21 native methods of arrays. Here's a little game for you to play afterwards. Mix up with pairs or threes or fours. It's Berlin, it's swinging, with none of us mind. Um, after the talk, grab a paper and, 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 uh, and a pencil and see if you can write down all of the 21 native, arrays, uh, native methods of arrays. My betting is very few of us would be able to do it. I'll give you a clue. There are seven mutators, seven excesses, and say, seven iterators. But you know, if you don't know this stuff, then you're not... Was that... Sorry. I thought someone was correcting me, which is entirely possible. Um, I love accumulating these. I'm a twitcher. A twitcher in English is a bird watcher. I almost keep a little book by the side of my desk, and every time I use a new array method, I note it down with the date and feel extremely proud of myself. Um, this I don't actually, clearly, that would be far too nerdy. Um, but I got to use array sum for the first time this week, and that made me extremely happy. And there's one of your iterators, by the way. Uh, uh, that's S-O-M-E. Obviously, S-U-M doesn't exist. If it did, I guess you'd use array reduce. So there's another one. There's two iterators, sum and reduce. Uh, just five of those to go now. Um, so learn your arrays, learn your falsy, falsy values. Start simple, learn falsy values. M build up. Strings are easy. There's not so much to learn about those, apart from coercion, but strings usually win that race. Uh, learn objects. Learn how to tell arrays and objects apart. Um, something that was in my talk earlier, but speaking to uh, Morgan, sitting at the front here, a friend of mine and known to quite a lot of you, um, something that came up there uh, just this morning was know the difference between uh, global variables and properties of the window object. They look exactly the same, but they're not. These are the things that mastery requires. And power. It requires power and mastery. Um, so there are two more things I want to say about JavaScript. I've got no idea how I'm doing for time. I'm probably speaking far too fast and nearly finished. Uh, the first thing I want to say, amusingly coming straight after... Oh, so learn CSS3 transitions. There's a slide. Um, won't help you with your JavaScript, but it will make you a better developer, I promise you. Learn them. They're really awesome. Um, well, let's flip over them. And it will mean you lose, use a lot less jQuery. Um, help us, then. We are allowed to use things to help us to learn core JavaScript. This is fine. I'm not too, uh, too harsh on this one, he says. Help us part one, then. It's frameworks. And um, we've just seen a fantastic, uh, fantastic talk about frameworks by a guy who knows an awful lot more about them than I do. Uh, frameworks are good. F frameworks fill the holes in JavaScript implementations in browsers, the shims. Um, they even out accesses to things that are difficult. It's ridiculous that the event model is still kind of hard to get to and not completely constant across all browsers. Uh, it helps us with repetitive tasks. It helps us do stuff that we would find difficult to do otherwise. So my question is, why are they so damn big and why do they do so much stuff? Um, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, clearly, you know some of them. Uh, some of them you don't. For example, those ones. Those are the ones I wrote. Um, you never heard of them because I never released them. Um, if, you, if you need the shims and you're traveling from job to job, let's get rid of those because you'll just focus on them. Um, I used to carry these things around on a, on a floppy disk, which became a CD, which became a pen drive, which broke. And I've got a backup somewhere, I'm sure. Um, but you carry around the functions that you really need. All of a sudden, you put, the frame, you put the functions you really need on a floppy disk, and you've got yourself a framework. One impeachment, one beseechment. Please do not put them on Git. There are enough there already. Use them to, as Sammy said, use them to fix the problems in your application. In other words, write them for your application. No doubt about it, you will code faster using a framework. You will knock stuff out more quickly. But I'm not interested in what your freelancer day rate is. I'm interested in making us better core JavaScript developers. And one word is, if you use a framework, even on the awesome ones I wrote, you will not become a better core JavaScript developer. Uh, I also have an interlude. 
Very nice. Uh, a couple of things about helpers. This is a helpers interlude while we're on the subject of both Git and helpers. Here are some things to consider as a JavaScript developer. Using Vi or Vim, drinking energy drinks, using Node, using Git. All of these will make you a better core JavaScript developer in exactly the same way that writing a fixie makes you a better JavaScript developer. I don't care what IDE, what text editor you use, I don't care what you drink, Club Mate is disgusting, whatever. I don't care if you're on Git or SVN or if you're on Sneaker, Sneaker, whatever it is. Um, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, it's what you do and not particularly the tools you use to how you do it, uh, the tools you use to do it. Um, which brings us on to help us part two. Um, as I'd like a beer and not a fist fight after this, we'd better move away from the git and the, uh, and the, uh, the Club Mate conversation um, and move swiftly on. Um, help us part two could also be called Coffee Script versus JS Lint. Uh, best way to look at these, I suppose, best introduction is to look at some quotes. Best quote I ever heard about Coffee Script was actually from a boss of mine uh, who said everyone gets bored of writing braces sooner or later. Um, if, you're using it on, if you're coding on a German keyboard, you're going to get bored of them even sooner. It's a real thing of fuck, but anyway. Um, this quote, I honestly don't remember who it's from. It was from one of the gods in ES Discuss. It might have been Marques Miller. It might have been um, half an hour ago I knew the other person it might have been. The better JavaScript you write, <coughs> excuse me, the better your coffee script will be. Uh, excuse me, drying up. The better JavaScript you write, the better your coffee script will be. CoffeeScript doesn't improve your JavaScript, it writes your JavaScript for you. It's sugar, it makes things easier. If we're attempting to be on the path to perfection, the path of mastery, the path of getting better, if you're committed to this road of improvement, you do not want to be making things easier for yourself. You want to be making them more difficult for yourself. Improvement comes from overcoming hurdles, from bettering your knowledge, not from bypassing them and taking shortcuts. JS Lind will hurt your feelings. It's the only quote about J.S. Lind that really matters. It's from Crockford himself. Everybody knows it. And by gun, does J.S. Lind hurt my feelings. It puts boulders in my path, but they're the sort of, <clears throat> they're the sort of boulders that I like. But my rules for J.S. Lind are you can only stop using it when you can effectively argue with it. I've seen some arguments against J.S. Lind that I do not understand at all. And if I don't understand those arguments, then I don't feel that I'm, uh, that I'm allowed to use them. What you can do, though, is you can look at the options. One var with white regex. Uh, one var enforces um, hoisting, stick a variable at the top. Uh, with says you're not allowed to use it. Uh, white enforces white space rules and regex. Eh, kills regex, basically. Um, let's start at the bottom. You don't have to be able to argue with the whole of JSLint, but you can only start turning options off when you can argue with those options. Regex, really easy to argue with. The rules for regex in, J in JSLint break all internationalization. Um, personally, I prefer dealing in internationalized stuff. Um, <coughs> so I turn that one off, nice and easy. Uh, white space. There's an argument that says code consistency is good. There's an argument that says, why are you telling me to use white space? It's a little bit trickier to argue with. With, for example, um, the guy currently talking downstairs um, won the JavaScript 1K competition this year. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a little canvas, jumpy game thing. It's absolutely fantastic. Crack open the code, have a look at it. It's amazing. It relies extremely heavily on with. But other than that, with is generally dangerous and it's generally bad. If your code is good enough to win the JavaScript 1K competition, don't use with. Other than that, it's probably considered bad. One var, if anyone can find an argument for not doing this, Buy me a drink. No, I'll buy you a drink. And buy, I'll buy you a case of drinks. There's nothing you can argue with about one bar at all. So James Lint, turn bits off. Am I, am I dying again? Turn bits off. Okay. Uh, when you can argue convincingly with them. Which leads us to a graph. This is the graph of JS Lint versus coffee script usage. Uh, percentage you're allowed to use them uh, uh, plotted against your own personal JavaScript skills or CoffeeScript makes things easy, JavaScript makes things hard. As you get better, you can start using one more than the other. Little note on that. JavaScript makes you think, CoffeeScript makes you fast. <laughs> um, if you need to think, then you shouldn't be speeding up. So, are, we, are we cool? Tell me when I'm, when I'm good. Um, if you need to think, you don't need to be speeding up. CoffeeScript 
is not a shortcut to mastery, it's not a shortcut to getting better, it's the reward you get at the end for being that damn good. It's the Karate Kid. Apprenticeship comes before mastery. If you can't wax on, wax off, you're not allowed in the ring. A couple more things to say, not very much, nearly there at the end, probably a bit too early, been speaking too fast. Um, one of the most important things, and Sammy touched on this as well, is that styles change. Um, about a year ago, this looked horrendous. This looked terrible to everyone that saw it. And I still know some people who argue with it. I think it's really cute and really neat, and it's not new, and we've all seen it. Um, you know, uh, assignment by, uh, uh, what is it? Assignment by some sort of Boolean check first. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, be prepared for. Uh, be prepared for styles changing and adapt your styles to them. Be aware of when they're changing as well. This one here is a little more controversial, maybe. If you go to Google and you type in JavaScript assignment in conditional, you get 15 pages of Java developers saying, this is so bad, don't do it, don't do it. Again, I disagree. I think this is, uh, this is really quite elegant, and it saves a line, and I think it's, uh, it's going to start getting used an awful lot more. Last thing on mastery, um, I was going to say, quite a bit about um, garbage collection and making things faster. Um, but I think a lot of you were just downstairs, and um, most of what I was going to say, I was going to nick from his talk. Um, so if you've seen all that, um, there's no point in me going over it. Um, there's only, we're going to skip over one and pretend that wasn't there. Uh, there was a mistake in it. Um, <laughs> several mistakes in it. Um, High-end mastery, then. We've done the easy stuff. We've done false values. We've done strings. We've done objects. We've done window uh, objects. Uh, we know all the methods of, of all the, the natives. Um, High-end mastery, then, is, uh, is about garbage collection. Um, if, you've mastering, if you're mastering the intermediate, uh, then move on to the, uh, the, the real hard stuff. Um, the only thing I really want to say about garbage collection um, is objects are not data dumps. Um, the most, I, I remember one step forward that I took uh, was when I was passing a single parameter into a function. And suddenly, I needed to pass two. And I was like, oh, crap, how am I going to do this? Because I really couldn't modify anything in the code. And uh, the guy sitting next to me, I was a lot younger, obviously. The guy sitting next to me said, pass an object in. I thought, this is absolutely fantastic. You've got two parameters for the price of one. Um, really, really useful. These days, though, my opinion is that you should never ever use an object as a data dump. Never just keep willfully extending an object. It's really, really bad. Um, the key word is keep your object shapes, object shapes the same. And I'm afraid I don't have a card for this. Um, but if two objects have exactly the same structure, then as you'll have heard from downstairs, I expect he mentioned it, um, the comparisons against them are like absolutely blindingly fast. Um, so tidy up your objects. For me, this is the one that I'm at at the minute. Um, I still extend objects absolutely willy-nilly. Um, I spoke to a colleague of mine um, about this. And he said, yeah, it's dead easy. Always use constructors for objects. Great advice. Uh, it's the one that I'm going to be trying to go for next. Um, so the final thing, then, uh, in, uh, in achieving greatness is autonomy. Um, autonomy is what happens when you have enough space and enough time to think about stuff. Um, the fable uh, myth about Brendan writing JS in, in, in 10 days, um, it wasn't that he sat down and wrote it in 10 days. It's that he was given 10 days of free time in which to write it. Okay, 10 days of free time is, is not a whole lot. But these 10 clear days without any molestation were when he could bring together everything he knew about Netscape and Smalltalk and Hypercard uh, and all the other things he knew. And he was allowed this creative splurge. Um, if in your workplace you are not given free time to do some of your own stuff, I'd change it. I mean, change it. it it's actually relatively straightforward. Um, get in there. Get yourself research days and research weeks if you're really lucky. Um, allow slack in your, in your agile uh, planning because we're all doing Agile, clearly. Um, allow Slack and you're planning to do extra stuff, just to sit and think if that's all it takes. Um, you need space and time and privacy, I suppose, to combine new ideas. Um, and autonomy leads to inspiration. Um, inspiration is ideas having sex. Um, inspiration leads to genius. Uh, I mean, it's genius. Excellent. Uh, you don't want to see that. Um, so we've talked about purpose, um, how, to, how to get great at JavaScript. You need purpose. You need to understand your product and your users and your team, and you need to know that they're all working for you. Um, mastery, do the easy stuff first. Don't assume you know all the easy stuff, because you probably don't. The intermediate stuff, has anyone come up with the 21 array methods yet? Let me know. The first one to do it, I'll buy them a beer as well. I just want a beer. Um, and the stuff you don't know, the real difficult stuff, 
and go over that as well. Uh, autonomy, allow yourself the room to breathe and room to think. Be the author of your own ambition, decide how far you want to take it. And most importantly, keep it to yourself. Don't tell everyone what your ambition is. They won't help you necessarily with it. Thank you very much. That's the end, apart from, of course, the final slide. I know there's only one reason you've stayed at the end. You want to know how many Klingons it takes to change a light bulb. Well, the answer is Klingons are not afraid of the dark. Thank you very much.